You're listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. For hundreds of ideas, free experiments and more, go to physicseducation.com.au. And now, here's your host, Ben Newsom. Ever wondered how to land a job in a major science museum? Well, our next guest certainly knows a bit about this. Her name's Karen Player, and she's been at the Australian Museum for over 20 years and originally started as a volunteer working in front of house, showing all sorts of science exhibits. Nowadays, she heads up the Museum the Box program, which sends materials all over Australia to libraries and schools to get science into communities with materials that actually come from the museum. She also coordinates distance learning events and has a few things to talk about where things have gone wrong, including trying to teach by video conference when your server room is flooded. No matter who you are, that's going to be difficult. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. Yes, and welcome again to another Physics Ed podcast. If it's your first time, welcome. My name's Ben Newsom. Glad to have you on board. If you've been here before, hi, I'm Ben again. Nice to have you as well. Thanks for tuning in to yet another science education program. This week, we're going to talk with Karen Player. She is a very good friend of mine. She's been doing a lot of outreach programs to schools and community groups and libraries and things for many years. She's also a coordinator for the Museum of Box program, as you heard in the intro, and a distance education science teaching expert. So... I hope you get a lot out of this. I certainly did. It was great to have a chat with her. She certainly delves in not only into how to teach via video conference, but also the value of narrative in how sometimes even the seemingly simple things can really grab people's imagination and attention if you give them a reason to listen. Hey, check it out. I enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy it too. You're listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. Why don't you book us for a science show or workshop in your school? We love seeing students get excited about science, and you will too. Go to physicseducation.com.au and click on Schools for more info. Hi, uh, Karen Player. Welcome to the Physics Ed Podcast. Hi, Ben. It's great Um, to be here today. I got this same look from Vanessa Barrett from a couple of episodes ago where I'm I'm like asking a good friend of mine, how are you going? You look at me going, you're seriously asking me a question like that? (laughs) Uh, dear. All right. So um, obviously everyone can hear that uh, I know Karen uh, pretty well, but um, you might not. So uh, Karen, I'm going <laughs> to, what is it you do? <laughs> well, I'm going to start off with the first time I met Ben as oh, one gosh. of the science in the bush events. I don't know if it was Wagga or Aubrey or something like that, but it's the first time I remember doing something oh. at the same time as you and you were presenting, of course, your amazing physics stuff. And I think I was doing like Mini beasts or spiders. You were, you were handling phasmid. You were dealing with phasmids. Yeah, I so believe. it must have been like a bit of a mini beast magnified kind of. Um, Charles session. Sturt University in Wagga Wagga, I reckon. Yeah, something about nine years ago yeah, or something like yeah, that. Something like that. So we we we've got a fair long history together, um, and I guess where I come from is uh, the Australian Museum, and I've been at the Australian Museum for. Oh, it's terrifying, but this year I think is twenty years. You so I pretty spent pretty much spent my entire career um, at the Australian Museum, and have been really lucky to have so many opportunities working in different areas. And so I currently look after outreach, so museum in a box, video conferencing, and we're just starting to do incursions um, this year. And um, I've been doing that role for probably the last maybe eight years, and prior to that was working on exhibitions. Um, so actually being able to form and decide what specimens go where and what um, objects can be touched, interpretation and that kind of thing. And prior to that was touring and um, developing education programs and visitor programs um, for the public. So That's um, quite a, quite a um, step up from uh, your first days as a volunteer. Yes, that's right. And um, yeah, like a lot of us at the Australian Museum, we did actually start as volunteers. So there's quite a few of my colleagues that have now been there for, you know, over a decade and and did start as volunteers because it was a great opportunity after I finished university when I was struggling with that, how do I actually get a job? Yeah, I actually um, got asked this. I was at Macquarie University doing a, a, a chat to some Psycom people and a, a, a person stood up and said, how do I do what I do? And I said, I just simply looked at them and said, start. Yeah. <laughs> Volunteer, yeah. start doing something. Yeah. Mm. So I was working some really funny jobs. I think I was a tea lady at a hospital. I worked at a cookie man doing the baking. Oh, I'll get like um, the cookie man. <laughs> It was quite good. Science of dough. And um, I think I was working in an office 
and then on the side um, started volunteering at the museum and it was the best thing I ever did. What I learnt they, something every day. What and, do they have you volunteering? I mean, there's a lot of things you could have been doing. What do they have you mainly doing on the floor or what, what was it? Yeah, so I, I became a front of house volunteer, which is working with the public. So I was got trained in to take tours. I got trained to do what we called activity stations or hands-on stations. So where we'd have them open for the public and they could come up in each exhibition and sort of have a hands-on engagement um, linking to their, their museum visit. We do have behind the scenes volunteers as well. So people that are working in the labs, working with collections. We have people working with members. We also have these um, event volunteers now, which are a bit shorter term for things like the programs like Jurassic Lounge, the Science Festival coming up in August. Yes. Um, so we actually have those sort of short terms, um, which have been really good for people going through uni or just post uni, wanting to get a little bit of extra experience in a different avenue. Um, or through science communication or education or um, – and so that, that's been really good as well. But, yeah, I came in as a front of house volunteer yep. and um, worked helping out. I think the, the first big exhibition we had was an ancient Egypt exhibition and we had queues, you know, three-hour queues out the doors. It was really huge. And so the staff burnout was actually quite a lot. So the volunteers actually came in to help quite a lot then. Yep. And I um, got my first casual gig then because they just needed people to help out because it was just so busy. It was really amazing. These things are flat out, especially when you come up to your science festival, you're coming up, whereas just we can't get more hours in the day if we try. <laughs> no, August August just kind of goes. It's It's a lot of preparation and then it's just Full, full steam ahead. For those people who haven't worked in science communication, um, and obviously as teachers you might go out to the various festivals and see us, us do all this fun stuff, for the science communicators it's a bit like a, a, a duck paddling water, I suppose, yeah. um, and we, you, we'd love to even catch up with each other, but we're so busy out on the stage and yeah. running programs. Yeah, often Ben or Holly or some of the other physics team can be at site, on site at the Australian Museum and for like two weeks and I <laughs> might not see them at all because we're just, we're just so busy. So I tend to do a lot of uh, video conferencing and on top of that when during August. So the festival on site at the museum is absolutely huge. I think we've already got 5,000 students booked in, wow. um, which is huge. We're, we're kind of expecting we might get 10. Yeah. For the schools that can't visit the museum, I then either – try to present the, the presenters that are on-site and video conference or live stream them so we can have off-site audience as well or run a, a separate stream of video conferences sort of like late in the afternoon after the on-site students have gone to enable more students to interact with everything Science Week. Now, this is something I'm really in love with. In fact, Karen actually taught me to do science education video conferencing quite a few years ago. Um, if you haven't done it, I, th I actually want to get into this because this is a real thing that you've been very much heading up with the Australian Museum. And um, my gosh, it can help out re regional areas in a long way. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I w it was actually it was interesting. I was watching a NASA uh, documentary um, talking about going to Mars a couple of couple of nights ago and it made me remember the first video conference we actually did at the Australian Museum in the year 2000 through ISDN lines yep. and it was actually with the NASA Habitat. So they're actually sort of do stuff underwater to train astronauts in how to get used to the conditions of outer space. It was amazing. We had a, um, a couple of groups. It was in the evening to deal with the time difference mm. with America. And we probably had like 50 kids. I think there were some scout groups as well that had come in and asked questions. And it wasn't till I watched that documentary and they were talking about the NASA habitat. It's like, oh, that's right. Like 17 years ago, <laughs> we did in a, in a different technology um we did this connection with, with NASA. So it oh. made me remember how amazing a lot of the NASA connections and their education programs for students are and how long they've been doing that digital, um, those digital links. And those dark days, some people might actually remember this with the um, ISDN. I mean, the amount of the cost of doing this was insane. It, it was scary. So we, we did a few in 2000s. We had an exhibition on biodiversity and we tried to do a lot of environmental programs linked to that. But again, very few people had the ISDN video conferencing connections. I think we did a program called Backyard Biodiversity yep. where we had hundreds of schools across the state sending out kits of how to go out and explore the mini beasts and the invertebrates in their schoolyard. Um, and then they could send stuff back to us. I think we did Backyard Biodiversity and Dung Beetle Mania. 
You got to have. It's mania about that. Uh, you've got to have the great trials. And you know, we found even in the inner city, yeah. they identified a new species of dung beetle oh, in, cool. in Sydney through that program. So we were trying to video conference and connect with those students that were doing the program to sort of have our scientists. So I just say the Australian Museum was just ahead of its time. Yeah. Um, certainly ahead of the technology. And um, we really didn't pick up our video conferencing again until about 2009. Yeah, actually, I started doing it in about 2010 or so. I think I ran into you when we were doing, remember the Astro Collie programs with yes. um, the Country yeah. Areas program yes. for New South Wales? They were brilliant. Mm. So the Country Areas program was something that was run and it was kind of how Dark Connections, which is the, I guess, the video conferencing providers. That's the uh, New South Wales Distance and Rural Technologies Group. If you type D-A-R-T-N-S-W into your search provider, you will find them. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And that's where all of the video conferences Mm. are advertised. So they had this um, program and they were looking for content providers. So Mm. they were, you know, um, seeking, you know, Physics Education Australian Museum, lots of the other cultural organisations to say, hey, we've got these thousands of students um, ready to go. Do you have content? So we did our first session, I I think we had 25 schools. I don't think I've ever done a session as yeah, big. Yeah, we had 15 in one yeah. go. It was pretty insane. Yeah, and mm. I think in the space of three sessions or four sessions, we had 6,000 students, which um, completely blew my number projections out of the water <laughs> <laughs> because we don't quite get that many per session. But it was amazing opportunity to really link resources, expertise to regional New South Wales, which is the whole um, point of the museum outreach um, unit at uh, at the Australian es- Museum. Especially when this is only just after the Connected Classrooms program had yep. been rolled out to, you know, 2,500 schools across New South yeah. Wales and it was the, the big thing. Yep. Obviously times have changed and things yep. and we don't see that many schools in one go and probably for very good reason. Yeah, it mm. was... Um, well, challenging. I have to say it's probably the hardest thing that, I, that I've done. But the team from Dark Connections were really amazing and helped support us through that and kind of gave us a little bit of an idea of what's possible. Um, mm. I know that uh, Dark Connections had a, a session for the Premier's Reading Challenge last year with um, Andy Griffiths. Yeah, cool. And they had 100 schools connect yep. and they hadn't had that for a long time. I think the other one that they'd done, they had 75 schools. So certainly things like that connecting with um, with some amazing authors um, really just yeah. gives so much opportunity. And it's a big thing because like um, some people in North America will be well aware of CILC, the Centre for Inter- Interactive Learning and Collaboration, as well as CAP Space from Polycom uh, where you can get these sort of events. But the sort of volume of schools that come through in um, New South Wales, Australia is insane. When, when a big event comes up, people certainly – get to play. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And and that's because really it's almost a decade now that that space mm. has been available for people. So, you know, there are still some units, um, video conferencing units that have probably never been turned on um, in some schools, but others are really active. And a lot of the time I find schools are not necessarily connecting with us, but they're connecting with each other. And I think that's still a really powerful use of that technology as well. So one of the things that um, Karen and I got to put together along with the Powerhouse Museum and our Sydney Lent, uh, no, it was, it was at Sydney Opera House. It wasn't Sydney Olympic Park at the start. It was a, it was a family of about six of us, for I believe. Yeah, um, State Library. No, Sydney Living Museum. State Library was, were early as well. Powerhouse and Sydney Olympic Park certainly were some of the early groups um, yeah. for Virtual Excursions Australia. We used to uh, meet up uh, monthly and um, the idea that we thought, hey, if we're going to be presenting with students, why don't we share ideas between our groups so that um, the students got a better deal out of it? And so there's a bit of an organisation which um, schools can certainly connect with, certainly within Australia, but of course overseas if you wish to as well, it'll be worth getting in touch, which is? Uh, so Virtual Excursions Australia. So what that is essentially is a portal that links you through to other sort of um, content providers. So people can have a bit of a profile up there. We put blogs um, and collate, sort of aggregate the sessions that are available under certain topics and then we can use that for promotion as well but it was something that um, Ben and I you know when you have a go to a conference and you get really inspired by ideas and 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 most of the time you get back to your job and you just don't have time to implement anything (laughs) this was one of those ideas that just seemed so important that we just got it going so we kind of had the idea we had through this conference there was quite a few people that were ready 
to get started on that sort of virtual um, excursion and sort of video conferencing level. And we all sort of came together. We had a competition of what to name it. We got a website and then sort of ran it from there. And it's for us, it's kind of just a bit of a professional network. We've been able to share, you know, what works and what doesn't with new content providers coming in very much that let's not all make the same mistakes over and over. And yep. certainly, uh, you know, in, in this community at our level, it was a really great opportunity to do it. You'd, we don't see it very often in this, this kind of collaboration that has been so successful. Yeah, it's insane. If and I, sharing. Yeah, there's a good 20 or so organisations were often involved and got up to 40 at one point. Yeah, yeah. So mm. but people come and go depending mm. on what their needs are. So definitely new people tend to be more involved because they sort of need that sort of um, helping and nurturing. And some of the organisations that have been, you know, running stuff for five years are like, oh, you know, we'll just get the minutes and, and drop in from time to time. So it's been um, it's been really a good network. Well, thinking about this from a um – so this is a long way from your first days as a front of house volunteer. I mean, obviously, yeah, leaving a science degree, uh, entering the big bad world outside of uni is a big thing. But why museums? Why not a national park or? Well, yeah, completely accidental. <laughs> That'll so happen. I yes. So I I went into university with grand plans to be a volcanologist. Oh, cool. So I'd completely got through high school, knew that I wanted to do science, hadn't, didn't actually have any idea what science. At one point it was a lot of marine science, so I'm just celebrating my 25th year as a scuba diver. Yeah, we need to go for a dive again, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I went on Sunday, it was brilliant. So through school, through high school, there was a couple of short unit subjects and one of them was a marine studies one when they got to go learn to scuba dive down at Jarvis Bay. I wasn't actually doing that course, but somehow I talked my way into going on the on the scuba diving course. So I learned to dive, um, I think must have been in year 11. And because that was because I had a passion for marine studies, I did my work experience at Sydney Aquarium yep. with scuba diving. But when I got to uni, obviously I transited. I think it's because I found an old box of assignments that I'd kept from really? primary school. Yep. So two, two assignments that I'd obviously kept and found. One was on sharks and one was on volcanoes. Right. Um, it's bizarre what you keep and what triggers. And it's like, that's right, I always loved rocks and I always loved that kind of landform. So I went and I had a big thing for ancient history. Yeah. I did ancient history through high school as well. I went, okay, I'm going to be, I'm not sure where it came from, but I'm going to be a volcanologist. I'm going to go to uni. I'm going to do a couple of art subjects with my science. So I'll do all of my geology and those kinds of things and physical environments, learn Italian, Oh, you were really into it. You were really yeah, going to yeah. do this. <laughs> yeah. This was first year uni. Yeah, cool. Everything was shiny. Yeah. Um, and also did some ancient history subjects. So essentially what I wanted to do was move to Italy mm. um, and be a volcanologist because that's, that's awesome. where all the active volcanoes were. That didn't quite happen for a couple of reasons. I was not very good at learning Italian. <laughs> <laughs> the thing I got top marks for was where the, the regions of food. So I was very good at that bit. I can actually read um, a paper and I can actually read right. little, Italian much better than I can speak it yeah. and all of the ancient history. So I, I, that's what I really wanted to do. And as I went through uni, a couple of things happened. First of all, not a big call for volcanologists in Australia. What I would have ended up directing is sort of the geophysics and geoscience and ending up in mining. Yep. And it's not the direction I wanted to go. So I loved all of my geology subjects. I'm still, you know, a bit of a nut for a bit of a natural disaster nut. Um, still love my volcanoes, but I ended up transitioning a little bit into more geomorphology. So more landforms, you know, rivers, those kinds of things. So a bit more recent on top. And what it led me to the museum um, essentially was then linking to that biodiversity. But the way I became a volunteer yeah. was actually having a whinge to a friend of mine going, why can't I get a job after I finished uni? I contacted every environmental consultancy company in Sydney and with resumes and yeah. couldn't get a foot in the door. A friend of mine's mum came out and said, oh, have you ever thought about volunteering? Yeah. And she was actually the volunteer coordinator at the Australian Museum and had said, hey, we take volunteers every six months or so. I'll let you know next time it comes up. So I had never thought about it. Yep. Never occurred to me that that was an avenue for 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 my skill set, my passion, for my love of communicating the science. So it was really a bit of a light bulb moment. Uh, she sent me the the forms a few months later. I applied. No one knew that I knew her. I didn't go through her as an interview. Yeah. I actually had a three person sit down panel interview to become a volunteer. 
And eventually after I was accepted as a volunteer, and she, she told people that we knew mm. each other. So it was, I, it was on my own merit, <laughs> um, just in case you're wondering. Yeah. And, and from there it really was just an absolute passion for that. The idea of museums, the idea of learning. The Australian Museum has a lot of cultural components. We have a lot of cultural exhibitions come through, but a lot of science as well. Actually, um, let's go down that path because mm-hmm. some people don't realise just how much active science really happens yeah. in the museum. Mm-hmm. So I suppose describe back a house. Yeah, so for the Australian Museum, the majority of what we do is behind the scenes. So a lot of a lot of museums are only public facing. So the Staff that work behind the scenes are just managing the collections, so materials conservation, and sort of archiving collections and making sure everything's where it should be. With the Australian Museum, we actually have an active science department behind us. So 50% of the staff, if not more, actually work in the science collection. So there's collection management, which is really important, but there's also research. So we've got researchers as well. Uh, we have a lot of um, university links. A lot of people come from overseas to work on our collections as well. We also loan some of our collections. We've got things called type specimens, which is the first specimen that was ever collected that was used for the identification. To describe properly. Yeah. To be described properly. Mm. And that then becomes a really important object. And so if other people around the world find another specimen of that species, they might want to go back to the type specimen to, to make sure if there's any differences or those kinds of things. Sometimes things end up being in a subspecies because they are different enough from the original. So we actually have quite a lot of type specimens. And at the moment, I think we're almost edging up to about 19 million specimens in yeah, our right. collection. So it's world-renowned, it's certainly world-class, and most people think of active science happening at universities, but certainly the Australian Museum and a lot of the big natural history museums in Australia do have um, a very significant science Actually, side of it. something I wanted to just throw out there, if you happen to be teaching biology at school, um, it'd be worth letting your students know that there's a number of taxonomists mm. are just not as many is needed, not even close. Yeah. Yeah. So it'd be worth even just letting them know that, um, I mean, obviously job opportunities are somewhat thin because they're required with funding, but the number, just trying to sort out the mess that was created in the 19th century, yeah. let alone what it currently is around. And, and we have situations <laughs> where we get collections do- that have been donated to the museum by sort of early naturalists. We've got some things in our collections that have never been identified. Yeah. You know, we know that we've got the collection that might have you know, several thousand specimens, but we don't necessarily have any more information than that. Well, I remember actually um, being lucky enough to go behind the scenes at the Royal Terrell Museum in Canada and just looking at all their dinosaur specimens there and the number of um, bones in plaster jackets yep. that just hadn't been opened yep. in years and years. Yep. It's just... It's incredible mm. and it's... Yeah, there's certainly so much work that needs to be done in terms of sort of museum preparation, museum um, on specimens, but also the front of house component. What I love to talk to both teachers and students about is the diversity of work there is at museums. We have people in, you know, social media. We have people in marketing. We have people all the way up to our venues and... um, uh, All the events people putting on Jurassic Lounge. Let's have a silent disco. (laughs) All of the events people, um, Mm. all of the programming people from early childhood to adult programs, you know, the people that work out what stuff to sell at the shop. So they actually go and commission new things. So they're actually designing them. We have designers that work on both 2D uh, print material but also design the layout of the exhibitions. Yeah. We've got text writers. So if you've got students that just love writing but want to write things that are interesting, um, you know, it, the text writers or the editors of those, yeah. not to mention all the education staff and the, and the science communication people, collection managers, taxidermists. Now, that is something that we don't get a lot of these days. Uh, the Australian Museum currently has two in-house taxidermists. Is that all? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they do two, th- two different things. So we have display specimens that are taxidermed, but also study skins. So study skins um, aren't in a display pose, so they're usually stretched out nice and long to be able to fit in drawers and those kinds of things. Jeez, and that's why often in the science festivals you have the careers chats yep. b- because of this because people just don't realise how diverse it actually well, is. that's exactly right. A lot of people think education and science communication is sort of one thing, but at museums it is really, really diverse. We've got carpenters that physically build our exhibitions. Someone's got it. Yeah, one mm. of the staff members that I work with called Tina Manson, she is an, essentially an expert in moulding and casting. So she makes all of the specimens for Museum in a Box and makes the dioramas. So essentially she is yeah, a, a specimen maker and a diorama maker. So she'll get the original object, she'll make a mould of it. Yep. 
then she'll make the casts and then she'll paint the casts up to look realistic and then put them in position in, in dioramas. And it's an amazing process and she might, you know, she does stuff for the exhibitions as well, um, but predominantly she works for Museum in a Box, making sure that resources that we send to schools across New South Wales and further beyond look fabulous. I, actually, I saw that in a um, photo of yours recently or someone in AM has done it because the Museum in the Box has actually just got passed a major... Yeah. Milestone, that's yeah. right. So last year was Museum in a Box 50th anniversary. And, Ooh. yeah, it's it's a, a real achievement. I can't take credit for all of that. I oh, probably, please do. <laughs> <laughs> I can certainly take some credit for the last 10 years and the growth that um, that we've had there. We've now got 30 different topics. Yeah. Most topics have about four boxes. So we kind of, you know, we've got hundreds of Museum in a Box. So I'm a school. I want to get a box off you, I get on the site, go type in museum in a box in the Australian Museum search box, I'll find the web page, I order from you, hey, I want this stuff, what happens next? So we um, have set loan periods. So we have eight loan periods a year that fit in with the New South Wales terms. So it's usually weeks one, two, three and seven, eight, nine. So the boxes go out for three weeks, come back to us, go back out. Do you have much breakage? Surprisingly not. I think there's a real, and we do pack, like things are sort of in foam trays and those kinds of things. But I think there's a lot of reverence towards the specimens. And, you know, it's a bit like Christmas. You get these boxes, you open them up and there's a preciousness about it. So people... Not in my house at a Christmas. Those kids go nuts. <laughs> but anyway. Okay. Someone that's really careful opening wrapping paper. <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of like, a, you know, a, a gift and a present. And we, we really find that we don't have a lot of breakage or theft. Sometimes we get things posted back going, oh, so sorry, you know, this book ended up in our library or, you know, um, so-and-so popped this in their pocket and, um, you know, brought it back a couple of days later. And it certainly happens, yep. but not as much. And, and there is a cost uh, on Museum in a Box, and that cost does sort of counteract a little bit of those sort of wear and tear. So very rarely do we sort of say, hey, you know, if there's been massive damage, we will um, put an extra charge on. But most of the time it's just absorbed into the cost of the program. Fantastic. Now, yeah. um, obviously, I mean, this is going to be a difficult question for you because it's not really your first day in museums. <laughs> always, always curious to find out, I mean, I don't know, name one, two or three, something that grabbed your imagination. Someone was teaching something or you saw something happening in school that was just wicked, that was just cool, it was just working so well. What are some of the things you've seen that are just really good? Well, it's been a big journey and I've seen a lot of amazing things. And I, for me, it's that hands-on connection, yep. being able to touch a real object. So from the Australian Museum's perspective, and, and certainly even now when I give a tour, it's something that people come back to me and say, wow, that's not what I expected. So in the museum, in an exhibition called Surviving Australia, we have a stromatolite. So a stromatolites don't look like much. They look like... Kind of a blob. Yep. <laughs> bit of a rock. Mm. Um, but these particular rocks are actually fossils. And the one that we have on display is oh, probably 100 kilos, if not more. And it is 2.8 billion years old. So 2,800 million years. And you're allowed to touch it. Mm. For me, that sense of scale and the story of stromatolites and the ability, you know, the millions of years that they helped produce oxygen, which enabled an oxygen-rich atmosphere, which then enabled um, evolution to come out from, from the water to land, that kind of story just blows me away. And the fact that you're allowed to touch something that old, um, and I, just, I tell people this is the oldest thing you'll probably ever be able to touch in your life. Yeah, um, you might get something if you know a, a little bit older. We do have stromatolites that are sort of three hundred million. We've got some that are three hundred, three point five billion years. Yeah, three, right. So I can't even get the numbers right because they're just so <laughs> big. So three thousand five hundred million, but those ones are actually not to be touched. But we do have some that are sort of um, much older than that. You got three a whole... billion that you can touch. But this one, two point eight, is you know it just that sense of scale and the significance of something that's so kind of underwhelming. Until you know about it, people walk past it and just don't even connect with it. Until Which is actually you the point. Them. It's about it's about the narrative. Yeah, yeah, and it's about the passion and the story. Like I'll have people going, "I never expected that that was going to be the favourite thing that I had on this tour," but it was because, uh, you know, you telling me the story and the rest of it and how it links to so much that that so that that's that kind of thing. Um, and just being able to have that physical connection. I'm, I'm a bit of a toucher. So, you know, I'll, when I'm at the, sh you know, going shopping for clothes, like I'll be running my hand through the clothes, <laughs> you know. Um, occasionally if I'm 
you know, daydream a little bit on the way to work, I'll be running my hand down the sandstone wall of Hyde Park on my way to the museum. I'm just sort of looking at the beautiful sandstone, the building. That's the geology, the geologist. So you're the reason, still. that's the reason why we have yellow paint around uh, hardware and stuff to stop people <laughs> from going near things because of you, Karen. Yes, yes, <laughs> right. I, I, yeah. <laughs> so those kinds of things mm. and, and certainly the experiences mm. I've been able to give through Museum in a Box and being able to mm. send, you know, resources and some cases they're replicas, some cases they're real, mm. but having this hand-on experience, this, this mini museum that gets sent around to schools and, you know, I think last year we reached over 120,000 not just students but sort of community organisations yeah. and adult learners and, you know, just people and they had a connection with the Australian Museum without having to necessarily come into our doors and, you know, a lot of people live really far away from Sydney, even just in Greater Sydney. It's, you know, it can be quite difficult to get into us so the more that we can provide the more that we can send out that sort of a tangible hands-on experience Oh, that's I a, think it's amazing. Well, I like it. I often ask this with lots of people um, and because I'm always curious because I, be- I truly believe that you're only as good as your worst thing you did. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, like, none of us are perfect. There are things that have gone bad, whether it's technical or whatever. What are some things where you've been running a class and it's gone completely pear-shaped? I'd, 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 certainly when we used to do a lot of presentations during school holidays, we were doing one on these this vo- volcanoes and this little boy just kept wanting to contribute. And he just, we're in the middle of talking about volcanoes and he puts out, yes, my dad's got a ladder. Yep, that's right. So my OK Google is trying to contribute to the conversation. Yeah, so this he's trying little, to find a ladder for you. Yeah, this little <laughs> boy just kept wanting to let us know that his dad had a ladder. And then right. the next part was volcanoes eat dinosaurs or dinosaurs eat volcanoes. So sometimes there yeah, that can be really challenging to keep the flow going when you've got someone that's really enthusiastic and wants to contribute, but it's just completely off topic. <laughs> oh, that, that's a skill. Yeah. Yeah, we, you know, we just kind of go, we have two people, so we kind of, you know, want to let the kids contribute, but we also need to keep it rolling. So that was certainly a fun one, and we were talking about it earlier. Mm. Um, in terms of remote delivery, we were doing some video conferencing, and it was actually with an external provider, um, which made it even harder. So we had an amazing author called Elisa Darlinson, and she'd just written a book called um, is it Puggles Problem, I think it was, about a baby echidna. And so, of course, we had... Uh, taxidermy kidneys. It was really great. And we had a whole day worth of sessions all booked in. Halfway through one, no, halfway through, I think the second one, um, we got someone come up and just say, the entire network is about to um, shut down at the Australian Museum. We have a flood in the server room. (laughs) So luckily I had a couple of moments warning and I was able to, you know, let the people that were participating with it at the time saying, I think in a few moments we're going to be disconnected. Um, This is why we'll reschedule. And sure enough, five minutes later, Every, everything went off. So we did have a heads up, but that's one of the things, completely a, a technical issue, completely outside the realms of anything we could do. Yeah, we've had, um, like, a, and just even thinking that because disasters can and will happen, especially in remote education, because what's going on the other side could be completely different yeah. to what's happened to you. I'm just remi- reminded of a time when we had, it was during fire season yep. in summer, and we were connecting with the school, and turns out that, yes, they had to evacuate because the fire was coming. Yeah, yeah. We had the same thing with some storms. I had, I was ready to do a session. It was about 10 o'clock. I'm like, where is everyone? And I end up contacting all three schools later. One of them, a massive storm front had come through. So it must have been a bit later in the afternoon. Massive storm front had come through. And even though they were 250 kilometres away, they'd all got affected by this. Yeah, you can watch them drop out as yeah. it moves. So one had been flooded, one had been evacuated, another one I think they lost power. Yeah. Uh, so all three. And then I thought, okay, well, I better call the next session which I think was about an hour later, and called all those schools up and said, you know, is everything okay? Are you going to be able to connect? You know, there was a big storm, and they're like, what storm? So it just happened that the three we had in the morning session were, we, you know, all sort of riverine away, and the three that we were having in the afternoon session were all northern New South Wales and wow. had no idea there was anything to do with the storm. Um, and they kind of were like, no, no, it's all good. 
Actually, so this is not really never know. a natural disaster issue, but I was once connecting to a, a school and the teacher rang up almost in tears saying, look, I just can't get into the room because music class won't move out. Yes, yes, <laughs> and I've had that one as well. And I guess something that for me that happens quite a lot is just um, the logistics of museum in a box. Like we have about 1,100 freight movements a year You're right. with getting boxes in and out. So we are, on average it's about 500 boxes alone each year. And so they're going in and out. And the one at the end of term, we've got a week buffer to get those boxes back before school closes. But every now and again, some of the paperwork doesn't work out and the boxes get sent back to the, the original school if they don't switch over their paperwork or, you know, they were just having such a good time or the teacher was sick and the other teacher didn't realise and they get stuck in school over school holidays because the next line arrives first day back. So I always have this school holiday panic of how many boxes are trapped in the school library or how am I going to get them out? How am I going to get them to the new school so they don't miss out? So that's that logistics, I have to say, is just a constant Ooh, challenge. I see. You're actually reminding me of a friend of mine, Deb, who runs this uh, place called Dissection Connection, and she sends these prepared specimens, biological specimens for dissection in schools, which means she's sending, you know, stuff that can rot yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in the mail. And it's, the an issue is if no one actually picks up the package off yeah. the floor, it gets yeah. a little little smelly. Yeah. Well, again, that leads me to when we used to work in Search and Discover. So Search and Discover at the museum is our inquiry centre. So we have people phone, walk in, um, email with, what is this I found in my backyard? When it's getting the months are getting warmer, we get a lot of snake inquiries. Yep. So one summer one very hot summer, um, over the Christmas period, so the mail slows down, we got a snake in the mail. Right. A dead snake. It was dead before it was in the mail. It had essentially almost liquefied in this bag and we were sent it to identify it. I think we're actually still able to from the, the scales on the belly, but it was terrifying to open this parcel. I've never, yeah, it was just like, the odour, we couldn't actually open it. We had to send a very polite but very stern email about how inappropriate it is. So I think it from, from the postmark, it was 10 days in the post. In 40 of, degrees. In 40 degree heat of mm. the snake. Yeah. So, yeah, that certainly was, um, you know, made us change a few things, made sure we were much clearer with people about what they're allowed to post in with us. If they want to send things like that, deliver it to us. We get cabs that come with little cooler bags from, like, from Westmead Hospital and those kinds of things right. with snakes or spiders that just get delivered by a cab driver in a little cooler. So, you know. How's the cabbie feeling about that? <laughs> hey, he doesn't have to ch- make chit-chat. That's right. Just, just throw, throw the red back in the back, no problem. Yeah. So, yeah, we often get those kinds of things to say, hey, can you identify them? We need this for, you know, for medical reasons or, you know, just to put in the books kind of thing. So we get those ones as well. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, you just never know what's going to arrive in the post. Look, thank you very much for coming along. I mean, I mean, you've got a very busy day ahead of you. You've got stuff to go on. Look, thanks very much. And um, look, obviously, there's going to be people here listening who would want to get in touch with you. So how would they do that? Okay, so the easiest option is actually to get me through the Museum in a Box uh, website. So you can Google Museum in a Box or do it off the Australian Museum site. You'll get to all of the contact details there. The email address is museuminabox, or one word, at ostmus, which is A-U-S-T-M-U-S, .gov.au. And yeah, we get emails from all around the world and inquiries. Even if we can't send you a museum in a box, we can certainly try to send you some of our education print resources that go with it. We often can do video conferencing, you know, pretty broadly um, around the globe, depending on time zones. But the Australian Museum's website itself is just, I think it's got like 40,000 facts um, fact sheets. It does. It is absolutely amazing. Um, so very much worth if you're looking at anything sort of Indigenous culture in Australia or um, any sort of animal components, definitely search that. It's really worthwhile. There's lots of lots of resources there. So, yeah, look forward to um, hearing from you. All right. Thanks very much, Karen Player. Thanks for coming on. You're welcome. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. We're all about science, ed tech and more. To see 100 fun free experiments you can do with your class, go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S. And click 100 free experiments. 
Well, there you go. That's Karen Player from the Australian Museum. Look, clearly she's a good friend of mine. We've worked together on many education projects. Uh, one of which comes to mind is a conference we did in 2012, I think. It was in Cairns with a number of distance learning professionals from the Sydney Opera House, the Powerhouse Museum, and a number of others. And uh, we got to actually spend a bit of breakout time with, with herself, her partner, and I. We just jumped on a reef cat and went out to the Great Barrier Reef to do some scuba dive. That was an awesome time. Yeah, we talked science, but let's be honest, it was just a time for a great break. And Karen, if you're listening, I think it's time for doing some more diving again, if we can ever pull ourselves out of teaching, which uh, is not going to happen anytime soon either. Well, we will see how we go. Anyway, I want to make sure we cover some of the points that I certainly got out of this interview. And uh, I know that you got out a lot more than just a couple of points yourself as well. But here we go. Here's the first one. Don't rush through museums. No, really, try not to rush. I know there's so many objects and you want to run to each gallery and hall to check out the new stuff, especially the new exhibits. But in the process, you can quickly miss the cool stuff that might just be a little bit understated. Karen talked about that meteorite, you know, three and a half billion year old meteorite that people often blunder straight past and don't realize it's even there. So next time you're in a museum, whether you're there with a family or a school group, try to take your time. And if you've really got a chance, and let's be honest, we don't always have the chance, if possible, see if you can break your visit into several days. I know certainly when I visited Washington to the, the, the Smithsonian's, of which yeah, there are quite a few of them, that is a whole heap of work to look around and check out. There's so much to learn in museums. So stop and smell the roses if possible. Uh, secondly, if you're trying to go into museums, if you really want to break into them as an educator, consider volunteering. It doesn't have to be about getting a paid job front up and center. Look, these things are highly competitive. And whilst I'm not involved directly in teaching within museums, I mean, our job is that we get invited into museums to do this as well. But if you want to work full time in a museum, you need to get some experience up and volunteering is a great way to go. And thirdly, things can go wrong. And if they can go wrong, they will go wrong. I think that's Murphy's Law. Well, That description of what happened to the server room in the Australian Museum when Karen was in the middle of a podcast, not a podcast, I'm doing a podcast now, in the middle of a video conference, it's going to happen. Things can go wrong. But you know what? Inevitably, people can always reschedule. Even live events where you're on stage and you're running a program or if you're in a school and you're trying to run this one experiment where you've only got one chance to do it, it's okay if things don't go quite right. Now, hopefully there's not as catastrophic as a server room getting flooded. I mean, that sounds expensive. However, it's okay. Things will go wrong. You can usually pick yourself up, dust yourself off and get going. So there you go. There's some of my learnings. I'd love to hear in the comments of the iTunes or on our website about what you think. What were your learnings? Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed podcast. Love your science? We do too. Here's this episode's education tip of the week. Grab your pencil and get ready to make some notes. So now it's time for another education tip, which I know is being used in primary schools around the place. Set up a garden which teaches science. Now, of course, there are plenty of primary schools where you set up a garden where they grow their vegetables. And this is a good thing. Healthy nutrition and good eating habits is very much part of the curriculum. However, is it worth considering putting a garden in as well, which is all about variable testing? And what I mean by this is maybe the kids can be looking at what is the impact of shaded areas versus well-lit areas, or if you're feeling a bit meaner, areas that have good soil and areas that have poor soil. Example, maybe literally an area that's been salted. Is there a difference in terms of the amount of fertilizer that you add to your plants in one garden bed versus another? Is there a way that you can look at Well, even just the structure of the plants, like get them to grow different versions of plants themselves so that they can learn a bit from flowers and their insect associations and that type of thing. You can teach science about composting. You can set up a worm farm. A school garden is quite useful when it comes to teaching biology and by association, therefore, ecology, interrelationships between 
different living things. So there you go. There's a simple tip you can set up. Don't just look about setting up a school garden because it looks pretty or because it can grow food, but is there an area that can also teach science? You could be setting up rain gauges and anemometers to work out the local climate conditions. There are many different things you can do about teaching science, and it doesn't just have to be about being in a lab. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. We're excited about science. Grab a copy of our new book, Be Amazing, How to Teach Science the Way Primary Kids Love, from our website. Just search Be Amazing Book. It's available in hard copy and ebook. Go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F I Z I C S. Yeah, there's definitely different ways you can be teaching science, and there are so many avenues that you can do this. One way that you can do this is with well, getting students to produce documentaries. In our last interview with Brett Salakis, uh, that's, by the way, the primary teacher who founded the Aussie Ed Twitter chat, which every Sunday night has hundreds, if not thousands, of teachers from all over the globe participate in talking about education and getting it really pumping in their schools. He's been very keen on getting students to produce their own content and in the process certainly learn a lot about science. They can film it and uh, the last two years that I've taught about the kids like capturing the, the rocket launch off the bamboo skewer in, in slow motion and, and then collating their experiments and collating their knowledge and making like a mini documentary. So they've been, they're able to sort of voice over, narrate, their own learning. They've got this beautiful digital resource that, that is, a, is a reflection of their, their learning. It's like a journal, I suppose, of their learning. Mm-hmm. But they've got their own footage. So they're not just downloading stuff off YouTube, which we love to do. And, you know, they're not just consuming content, but they're actually creating their own content. So it's, it's, it's tangible. They're getting in there, making their experiments, but then they're actually building their own, their own sort of content as well in the program. And for me, that's magic. Yes, you can imagine students would have a lot of fun with that. I mean, filming their own projects and getting it to post it online, kind of showing off about their skills and what they've learned so far in your class, that's going to really grab their attention because suddenly their learning is centered around them, then about what you specifically want to tell them all the time. They can be a bit about masters of the things they are learning about. And in the process, learn a bit of film editing as well. If you want to check out that whole interview with Brett Salakis, certainly jump on the Physics Ed podcast. Just jump onto iTunes or go visit our site. We've certainly got links there. And uh, you'll find out a lot about how Brett's been not only teaching about you know getting kids to do mini documentaries, but also why he set up the Aussie Ed Twitter chat and a major project that he's got called World STEM, which involves teachers uploading videos about how they've been teaching science lessons and well beyond in their own classrooms. Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. Sign up now for our fortnightly email newsletter. It's loaded with details on new experiments you can do, STEM teaching articles, new gadgets, exclusive offers and upcoming events. Go to physicseducation.com.au. Scroll to the bottom and add your email. And that just about brings us to the end of yet another Physics Ed Podcast. Hey, thanks for tuning in, especially over the weeks we've been releasing more and more of these podcasts out. We've been getting some great feedback and I hope you're really enjoying it. Hey, to help extend your teaching, jump on our website. There are so many free things that you could be using. Uh, look, there's over 100 articles on teaching science. There's a whole resource section on free experiments in uh, force and movement, heat, light, sound, Uh, kitchen chemistry, space science, geology, uh, you name it, it's probably there. And if it's not, we should write it as well. Uh, Yet, all you got to do is, you know, obviously read how to do the experiments and go and get the materials from your local shops and you'll find most of the time they are very cheap and easily accessible. You can easily get them quite easily. So uh, definitely check that out. Hey, speaking of checking things out, go onto iTunes and check out all the other podcasts and maybe subscribe. There are... There's a number of interviews lined up, and next week is, well, an interesting one. We're going to be speaking with the education team from the GWS Giants. Uh, For those overseas listeners, uh, GWS Giants is a major football team in Western Sydney. They've been doing a lot of community outreach for several years, well, frankly, since inception, to get kids involved with their schooling and get into leadership and really just embedding themselves in the community. Uh, We've been also working with the GWS Giants on delivering paired programs with them on science. And you might find this a bit interesting, uh, how we work with a major sports team 
to deliver science outreach in primary schools. So definitely check that out. And uh, look, as always, may your science lessons be fun. Please make them as informative as possible and make them grab your students' imagination. You've been listening to me, Ben Newsom. I'm from Physics Education. And of course, you've been listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. Catch you next time. You've been listening to another Physics Ed Podcast. We're excited about science. Subscribe to us on iTunes to download the next episode as soon as it's released. And don't forget, for hundreds of ideas, free experiments, our new Be Amazing book and more, go to physicseducation.com.au.